Titus chapter 1. If I were to entitle our time together this morning, I would call it this, From Grace to Godliness. From grace, we're far from God and, and need his kindness and love. From grace to godliness, from, from salvation to service. You know, often when we encounter a new book of the Bible, we'll spend a little bit of time considering who the author is and to whom it is written and when and why and where and how and all those things. Well, today, I think there's so much just in these first four verses that we're going to jump right in. And we're going to walk through this book over the next couple of months, line by line, verse by verse, precept by precept, seeking to make sense of the text and application to the text. And so there will be a time to see more about those types of things. Who was Paul and why is he writing this and all those things? You see, Paul begins this letter we're going to see today in these first four verses in a way that he kind of begins most of his writings to individuals or a collection of churches. He, he takes the time to identify himself and then do something that's, I don't know, maybe we'll look into this more throughout the book of Titus. It's really intriguing to me. He'll often validate his apostleship. Seems like it was always in question. Well, should we listen to Paul? And then what he'll do is he'll greet them and pronounce a blessing upon them. You'll see that today, identifying himself, kind of validating who he is in Christ and giving a greeting and then blessing the individuals. And today, you know, salvation to service, grace to godliness. Here's my, um, here's the way we'll look at this text together. Believe it or not, it's alliterated. We are servants, verse 1. Number two, verse two and three, this may sound a little weird. We're safe. You're safe. You're going to be okay. Verses two and three. And then, verse four, we, you and I, those of us who know Jesus, we are set apart. We're servants. We're safe. We're set apart. Now, here's the deal. I believe as you own these truths, not just commit what Billy Graham would call the greatest sin in America, just listening to these truths, just listening to a sermon, but listening to learn so that you can love, lead, and live just like Jesus. I think they will be tools for you this week to say, man, I can understand who I am in Christ. I'm living better because I know I'm safe in the hands of a capable God. And I'm set apart, so I'm, I'm different than the way others would respond. I'm unique. Many people might call you that in, in unique ways, but I'm unique, you know. I'm set apart. Well, let's do this. Let me read the text in two different translations. First, the New King James, which is a wonderful, wonderful word for word. And then the New Living, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful thought for thought translation. Verse 1, Paul, out of the New King James. A bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness and hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior, to Titus. A true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now a thought for thought translation. This is what it says. This is the letter from Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen. And to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life. Which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. And now at just the right time, he has revealed this message, which we announce to everyone. 
It is by the command of God, our Savior, that I have been entrusted with this work for him. I'm writing to Titus, my true son in the faith that we share. May God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Savior, give you grace and peace. And Lord, would you do that in Jesus' name? Amen. Number one, we're servants. Now, here's the deal. Who's the guy that's writing this letter? You can talk in church as long as you talk to me and not to one another. Well, who's, who's writing this letter? It rhymes with Maul. Paul. Paul's writing this letter. Now, his name, here's what's so interesting. It means little. It means small or humble. Paul was clearly, without a shadow of a doubt, one of the most effective missionary theologians, best kind of theologian to meet, of the New Testament. When he's penning this letter to Titus, he is an older guy. He's nearing the end of his life, has a greater sense of clarity of who he is and what he stands for by this time in his life. And he states four things in this first verse about who he is. Now, let me have your attention if I can. This is not siloed to the Apostle Paul. Well, these are just things who belong to Paul. No, in Christ, these four things also belong to us. And here they are. Number one, as someone who's a servant, we're also, and here's the funny thing about these next four. They all start with S. Isn't that weird? We're slaves. Slaves? How do you get that? Well, see, Paul identifies himself as a servant of God. The context of what he means and the language that he would have been writing in in that day means doulos theo, which means what? The bond servant of God. Say, great, that absolutely means nothing to me. What, what does that mean? Well, let me give you a little context. In Gentile cultures, cultures that were not Jewish, and the empire of the day, the Roman Empire, they considered bond servants, those that chose to be slaves where they were, as less deserving of respect than animals. Now, this means nothing to a 21st century doodle owner. You know what I mean by that? Anyone know about a person that owns a doodle? Have you ever met a person like that? I'm a doodle owner. I'm going to own up to my situation. Like a lot of doodle owners, they're like, hey, so how often is he groomed? And what kind of food do you give such doodle? And what toys? And how often does the doodle get entertainment of training and time with other doodles? And listen, in the Roman Empire, there were no doodles. They could care less about animals. It was not this kind of thing that like, oh, you know, a bond slave is just a little less deserving than a respect of an animal. No, animals, they were treated as one of the lowest rungs of society in this time. And the Romans valued their freedom. And here's what they took great value in. They delighted in making subjects to servitude out of lesser people. Meaning if you said this, hey, my name's Paul, it means little. And I'm the bond servant of God. Everyone would have said, not following that guy on Instagram. There's nothing there to see. This isn't a filtered life. He is who he is. There's nothing there. But for Paul, true identity and freedom was found in recognizing who he was. I'm a slave to God. Now, for Bible students, you may find this interesting. This is the only time in the entire Bible Paul identifies himself in this way. He often uses the word slave of Christ. You see that everywhere. But this dynamic that he's the slave of God. That God is the one who's filtering everything in his life. That what he says goes. That for his life, it exists solely for the purpose of accomplishing what his master wants. He was a slave. First Peter, for those of you that like to read the Bible, I'd encourage you to read chapter 1, verses 8 through 19, and 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. Paul talks about how his life was no longer his own. I'm amazed by those who can do the splits. Have you ever met anyone that can do that? It's amazing. I could never, never do I want to. It's not an interest of mine. But I think many Christians seek to put one foot in the world and one foot walking with God. And over time, 
it becomes extremely uncomfortable and awkward and painful, and you can't move forward in any direction. You see, for Paul, he recognized in his identity as a servant, first and foremost, I finally got it at the end of his life, he would say. I'm a slave of God. And secondarily, he would say, I'm also sent. You see, he calls himself an apostle. Now, that word has generalities to it and specificity to it. You say, what do you mean by that? Generally, apostle is just someone who's sent on behalf of another to accomplish a task. But specifically, in this day and in this time and for this title, it's an eyewitness of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Someone who in that context would have been seen as, hey, this person saw Jesus. You may say, how did that happen? Didn't Paul meet Jesus afterwards? Ask John Spencer. He'll tell you. He knows. But specifically, he was an apostle. And generally, listen to me, he recognized that he was a sent person. Do you know what Jesus said to his disciples? As the Father has sent me, John chapter 20, so now I send you. One person much smarter than I once said this, every heart is either the mission field or a missionary. There is no other. That, that every person who names the name of Christ has been sent into the family that they're in, the community that they're in, the workplace that they're in, to represent Jesus. That Monday, let me put it this way, Monday matters. Tuesday is significant. Wednesday has wonderful significance to your walk with Christ. That you're sent to where you are. You didn't just show up. That God has his hand upon your life. See, as Paul opens this letter, there's this, this dichotomy of humility and authority. Not based upon his resume, but based upon the one who sent him. See, he's, he's a slave, he's sent, but he's also selected. Selected. What do you mean by that? He says in verse 1 this, I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has. What does it say there? It starts with a C and it rhymes with Mosin. He's chosen them. Chosen them. One helpful supplemental resource that I often will reference is this little commentary series. It doesn't mean that I, you know, align with everything that's said or nuanced and believed, but I find this interesting. I wanted to read this to you. The author says this, Paul sees no dichotomy, no contradiction between the sovereignty of God and the human responsibility of man. Salvation from beginning to end is the sovereign work of God's grace, and yet no one will be saved who does not repent and believe. And all who repent and believe will be saved, Romans 10. I love what he says here. He says, I understand Paul to be a combatalist, compatibilitist. I can't even say that word, meaning things went together well for Paul. Theologically and soteriologically. You say, what are these words? Like the way he thought about God and how someone gets saved. That it's compatible. It's not at odds. He says he believed God elected and predestined people to be saved, but did so in such a way as not to do violence to their free will and responsibility to believe the gospel. And he quotes this guy. He says, the great prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, once commented on this issue this way. He saves a man by grace, and if men perish... They perish justly by their own fault. How, says someone, do you, how do you reconcile these two doctrines? And he said this, my dear brethren, I never need to reconcile two friends. Never. These two doctrines are friends with one another, for they are both in God's word, and I shall not attempt to reconcile, and neither should we. I love that. Because not everything is just a sum total of your choices. Have you seen that on Reels on Instagram? Your life is just the sum total of your choices. Really? I'm in control of everything? No. But do your choices have impact and consequences? Absolutely. But is there a God who's bigger than your choices, who sees things from beginning to end, who chose you, and some way in this mysterious dynamic of God's ability, his sovereignty, 
and your ability to walk with him freely, walk together hand in hand as friends. You say, well, I don't understand that. Well, let me try to tell you something. You and I trying to understand God completely, thoroughly, 110%, is like the ant trying to understand the internet. Do you understand that? That you and I are not God. That, that his ways are higher than our ways. If we were on an equal playing field, then we would be on an equal playing field. But you are the created, not the creator. And here's this beautiful thing. Don't miss this. You're chosen. You're chosen. See, you're a slave, you're sent, you're selected. But also, as it says there in the last part of verse 1, we're sanctified. We're sanctified. Paul says, and their knowledge of truth, which accords with godliness. See, saving faith, someone who genuinely knows Jesus, their life changes. Period. There's no question about that. In the long run, your life begins to change. If it hasn't, then you haven't changed. Does that make sense? That salvation will lead to service. Grace will lead to godliness. An apple seed will lead to a pineapple tree, right? No. This is what will happen. You can't separate the two. Faith leads to faithfulness. Love leads to a lifestyle of obedience. Grace leads to godliness. Salvation leads to service. You see, in this opening line of Titus chapter 1, verse 1, we see the purpose of ministry to God is very simple. I want to see people come to know me. You're sent. You're sanctified. You're selected. You're following God as a servant. And growth in godliness happens when someone finally grasps the gospel and then makes life all about God and just slowly but surely begins to grow. And that's a very personal thing, one-to-one -one between you and God, where you recognize who God is and how gracious he is in giving his son Jesus. And then in your life, you begin to read his word. You begin to tell people about God. But you learn quickly, sure would be nice to do this with others. Like the gospel, making God center, growing, yes, that has its place, but also gathering to worship, grouping to connect, going to live on mission, and recognizing that one day we'll be gone. That's the good life. That's the seven G's of the good life. The gospel, God, growth. Gather, group, go. Together, one day we'll be gone. I saw this on Instagram the other day. Every hundred years, there's a whole new group of people. Every hundred years. And these are the people. We didn't choose them. They didn't choose us. But someone did. God is sovereign. The people around you are not happenstance. And often, the greatest opportunity for life-giving ministry is through people, people, people. And see, Paul goes on to say in verse 2 that not only are we servants of God, but we're safe. Look at verse 2 and 3. Let me read it to you again from the New Living. He said, this truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. And now at just the right time, he has revealed this message, which we announce to everyone. It is by the command of God, our Savior, that I have been entrusted with this work for him. You see, the beautiful thing about being a Christian, let me say that again. The beautiful thing about being a Christian, one more time. The beautiful thing about being a Christian is that it has more to do with being than doing. Belief before behavior, salvation before service, godliness comes from growth. You see, as we understand who we are in Christ, it leads us to action 
on behalf of Christ. Have you ever heard me say this or someone else? Instead of trying to be like Jesus, just like him. Instead of trying to be like Jesus, just like Jesus. Then you'll find yourself becoming more like Jesus. It's this beautiful thing in marriage that if a husband will say, you know what? I am going to love her whether I feel like it or not. Because that's what I've been told to do. I recognize the authority structure in my life is God first. And he has told me to love her sacrificially. Yeah, but she always wants the last word. I'm still going to love her. Yeah, but she doesn't respect me. Here's what I've learned in marriage, both by observation and participation. If the man will die to himself and evidence love in a way that is EQ'd appropriately, meaning you know her and you know what connects with her, and you love with no anticipation or expectation of anything in return. Here's what happens over time in most cases. The wife begins to respect the husband because she's like, did you see him get flowers again? Did you see him do this? Did you see him do that? But in order for a relationship to work, somebody has to die. Die to being right all the time. Died is saying, well, I'll do the right thing when this one does that thing. Continue to stay on a cycle of craziness, of no connection. But here's what I have found. God, I'm just going to be who you tell me to be because you tell me to be. That's it. Watch what God can do with someone who's surrendered and says, it's okay if they treat me as a servant. It's okay if they don't respect me. It's okay if they don't like me. I'm still going to do the right thing. Because God, you are my authority. You're the one I answer to. And in you, I'm, I'm safe. I'm secure. I've been chosen. See, what does he say there in verse 2? This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life. Confidence of life secured with God. See, we're not only servants of God, but we're safe and secure because of God. And understanding who he is, that he's not going to lie. He's not capricious. He doesn't change. You can depend upon him. He will provide. He will see you through to the end. This should give an element of confidence in your walk today. We can have certainty and security because of our standing with God. You see, we have his character. The, these first couple of verses are so powerful because it's like a saving faith leads to a lifestyle of faithfulness. Paul mentions this word hope. And it's not this dynamic, man, I hope he ends on time. We're only in verse 2. No, it's not that kind of wishful thinking. But it's this certainty. I know he will end on time. Like, it's going to happen. It's an expectation of something that's coming, but not yet. I'll never forget this. Years ago, my wife and I were living in this place called Destin, Florida. And we used to go to this uh, Mexican restaurant. And uh, after the Mexican restaurant, we'd go to this place called Yogurt Mountain. Kind of like Sweet Frog. You know Sweet Frog? You've heard about that? Well, Yogurt Mountain was this place that truly you can make a mountain out of your yogurt with all the toppings. And at that time in our life, we only had two little girls. And I remember these two little girls. We, we left the, the, the Mexican restaurant and we're headed to Yogurt Mountain. And it was, the, it was a good meal. I mean, everyone ate their dinner. And one of the little girls filled up their to-go cup with pink lemonade. Loved pink lemonade. And we're on our way outside of the Mexican restaurant to get into the van to head to Yogurt Mountain. And this little girl loved Tom's shoes. Does anyone remember Tom's shoes? Are they still something that you wear? And this one had like pink bedazzled type shoes and they were too big for this little girl. And this little girl's my daughter. I'm just like not telling you the names just to protect the uh, identity of this person. But this little girl had these pink shoes that we told this little girl, they're too big, don't wear those shoes. Oh, no, no, no. These shoes are the best, I have to wear them. No, you wear those shoes, there's gonna be problems. Nope, I'm wearing them. All right, let's see what happens. So. We leave this place of Mexican food to head to the van. 
she's got this big styrofoam cup of pink lemonade, big old pink shoes on, and she's so excited for Yogurt Mountain. She knows that's coming because mom likes it, and so that's what we're doing. We're going to Yogurt Mountain every Saturday night. Um, that's what we would do. It was a rhythm. She knew it was coming. So here's what happens. She leaves the restaurant. She's clanking and clunking those big old shoes, and she trips. And not only does the pink lemonade go everywhere, but she goes right on her knees. And it had been a while since the asphalt had been laid again on that parking lot, so it was very gravelly. So a little bit like hamburger meat became her knees. Wow. It was sad. The shoes are off the feet. Pink lemonade is everywhere. Rocks are in the knees. And I will never forget this. We're still going to Yogurt Mountain, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, your lemonade, your shoes. But here's what she had that was just guiding and guarding her heart. She had hope. She knew, I am going to Yogurt Mountain. So she was good to go. Like, it was okay that she'd spilt the milk, you know, lemonade. You get to get, you understand what I'm saying? Like, here's what the point is. The point is, we have hope of eternal life. We're safe. No matter what happens to you. You're still going to heaven. What can they do to you? They can't take that from you. But see, if there's something that you value greater than Christ, then I feel sad for you. Because they can take that from you. And if that's your value, comfort, ease, control. Yeah, that can be taken. It's true. But those aren't our God. That's not what we're living for. The next trip, the next promotion, these are too small of a things for you and I. They will never ever satisfy. They will only ever gratify. That's not what you're made for. You're made for satisfaction of soul. And salary, status, sex, substance, situation, stuff, and sport are good things. But when you take a good thing and make it a God thing, it robs you of the good thing that the good thing was intended for. It becomes an idol, an odd thing, and then it robs you of the good that it could have had. But held in its proper place, sport is a great thing. Salary is a great thing. Stuff, good thing. But when it becomes God, there's a diminishing return on the gratification level that that idol gives you. So enjoy all good things under the glory of God, but don't be enslaved by them. Steward them. 38 special. Hold on loosely. You know that song? Hold on loosely. Maybe not. That's how you hold on to things. You see, that's when you're safe. You know his character. God's with me. But you also know his word. See, the beautiful message of the gospel entered time and space just at the right time. At the time that Jesus showed up on earth, it was uniquely possible for the gospel to spread. There was a common language, Greek, the language of trade, business, and literature. There were virtually no frontiers known at that time because of the vast nature of the Roman Empire. Travel was comparatively easy. It was slow, but safe because of the security that the Roman Empire roads and sea routes gave to the people. During this time, it was known as Pax Romana, and it was this time where the world was uniquely conscious of its need for a Messiah, a Savior. One Bible commentator put it this way, there was never a time when the hearts of men were more open to receive the message of salvation which the Christian missionaries brought. That's what Paul's talking about there in verses 2 and 3. At just the right time, Jesus came. Don't you find that to be true in your life? That God's rarely early, never late, but shows up right when you need him. You can trust him. You see, it's in the character of God and the word of God that we're encouraged in our standing and that we're safe. We're safe. Let me share this with you. We're almost done. I know of nothing compared to what it's like to be reading your Bible or to be listening to a sermon or, or taking in a worship song. And feel like everything around you kind of fades. 
And you're like, are, are you speaking directly to me? God, by your spirit, I, I sense that you're speaking to me through your word. I know of nothing better than that, than sensing the calming presence of God through his word. It brings an element of safety to my soul. I see that with six children. I have a son named Leonidas. Leonidas has learned this summer that he doesn't have to wear a sun shirt. Do you know what a sun shirt is? Something that you put on a boy to keep the sun off of him. Well, one time he saw one of his cousins without one, and he goes, you don't have to wear that? <laughs> he ripped that thing off. He's never worn it since. And he's learned how to swim without the floaties, is what he calls them. So this is a wonderful summer for Leo. Every day is in the pool. Dad, catch me. This is what he likes to do now. And there's this sense of security and safety because I have caught him every single time. There's like no question for Leonidas. I can trust Dad. Laney. It's interesting. Laney is, is just graduated from diapers. We have been in diapers for 15 years. <laughs> this is a wonderful... I feel like we need an award. You know, like, that was a long time to be in diapers. We're no longer in them with Laney. But here's the deal. Laney, when we're putting her to bed at night, it's interesting how just the sound of the voice of her mother or father can calm her. Because she's also not only graduated from diapers, but the crib. She's in a day bed. And we were very concerned. Because, like, you can't lock her in there. You know what I mean? Like, there's bars on the crib. But, like, with the day bed, there's, it's completely open. It's chaos. Hoping for a three-year-old to stay in there. But she does it. And I just say, Laney, you're safe. Stay there. Okay, Daddy. And she goes to sleep. Not that quickly. I don't want to paint some kind of weird utopian society where we're all, every time, every, no, there's still kids. But, like, the dynamic is, like, there's this sense of, I can trust Dad. I'm safe. It's a scary world out there, guys. How are you doing with dad? When was the last time you talked to him? Um, well, don't you think it would be awesome if there was a church that cared so much for you that every single day they put together a video to help you go through God's word so that you could trust him? The answers are in here. Get to know this book. If you're going to become good at anything, Get to know this. Get to know this. See, as believers, we are slaves of God. We're safe, but here's, here's where we are. Last verse, last point. We're set apart. Verse 4, I'm writing to Titus, my true son in the faith that we share. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace and peace. You see, we share a common faith. A common faith. A faith that thickens relationship. A faith that's thicker than the blood of natural family is the blood of our spiritual family. See, we're in God's family. And we must always remember that it belongs to him. He's not just our king. He is. He's not just our master. He is. We're his servants. But he's also our father. I, I wouldn't, I, I, I mean, but Jesus, he, he would use the word Abba. It's like the tenderness of a child to a loving, caring father. This was not the way in that day and time. You addressed God as, oh, sovereign creator. And Jesus shows up and says, hey, dad. Our dad gives us benefits by being part of the family. What are they? Grace, unmerited favor. I know we all want justice in the world. I get that. But how many of you personally are thankful that God is gracious to you and doesn't deal with you justly as he could? Mercy, unlimited compassion, not getting what we do deserve. Peace, an unsurpassing sense of wholeness. You see, here's how I want to close this this morning before we take communion. In these verses, I don't know if you've caught this. I don't know if I've done a good job of explaining this. Paul really knows who he is and what he's doing and why. You see his identity being very clear here. I'm a slave. I'm set apart. 
I'm safe. And I'm sent. Sometimes it's easy to lose perspective. There's a lot of stress. There's a full calendar, tropical storm maybe, kids to feed, schedules to keep. This is life. But through it, we must remember who we are and what our purpose is. You see, in this opening letter to Titus, Paul clearly states his identity. I'm a lover of God and I'm a servant of God. I'm a lover of God, and I recognize that he sent me. May I ask this question? Who are you? Like, don't, don't let other people answer that. That's who you are. Well, this person loves God. I can see it. Isn't it interesting that the early church didn't have to identify as Christian? Other people did that for them. Like, you're like a little Christ. They would say, I'm just following the way. That's how they identified. Like, for them, Christianity wasn't a box to check. It was a way to live. It was a lifestyle. Who are you? Do you know? And who you are changes from season to season. What do you mean by that? Like your primary purpose or function, which much of identity is attached to, right or wrongly, it is. Who are you right now? And how has God equipped you? with a unique set of skills or abilities or the relationships? Have you identified them? Second thing we see is not only identity, but purpose. Paul recognized that he was a means by which God would lead others to faith, to strengthen their knowledge of truth, to establish their faith. May I ask this question? What is your why for what you're doing right now? What's your purpose? What do you most want to see fulfilled as a result of you being on earth? Be specific. Avoid the statement that has a word should in it. Here's what Paul did. He identified his calling. I'm here to proclaim God's word. And he affirms his relationship with God and with others. Let me ask this question. To whom are you investing in? You see, over the next couple of months, here's what we're going to see. We're going to go through the book of Titus and one of the epistles of Timothy. You're going to see this dynamic of Paul modeling for us and calling us all to be giving our lives away to the people behind us, the next generation. Let me share with you very quickly, if I may, one of the reasons we established students honing occupational performance. We call that SHOP. Because in 2017, I was connected with some families who'd lost their sons to suicide. And there were three others that had said, well, if they go, we go. And then during that time, I got to know these families and shop owners of different kinds. And there was this challenge. Hey, these kids, why are they so sad? Look at what we give them. Hey, these kids, how come they don't know how to show up on time? How come when we give them feedback, they stiffen? They don't receive it. How come they don't work? So those are a lot of good questions. It's a lot of good questions. I don't know. But I do know this. Nobody wakes up from the womb knowing how to do that stuff. You need models and mentors that are either intentional or unintentional to learn from. And so there was this idea. Gracious, I have six kids. How can I be more intentional? Spiritually? Physically? emotionally, relationally, mentally, financially, in their training. Well, I have learned that if training is entertaining, it sticks. But if I think my job is to entertain them, I'm offbeat. What they crave is to know God, to experience life, genuine community, and to know that they're loved and discover their purpose. 
So I thought, well, that's never going to happen unless it happens, like we're intentional about it. So what if there was this dynamic where the older began training the younger? And then I went to Peru earlier this year and Dominican Republic and a few other places, and I saw shop modeled where it was like a 14-year-old was explaining to us how they filtrated the water for their village because they needed to. There was necessity. And out of necessity came this dynamic of training. And training led to this child having so much joy because he was purposeful in, in contributing to his community. So why do you share all this? Do you have a son or daughter in the faith? You see, Jesus was a traveling single rabbi. For him, his disciples became his family. Well, I was trained in this way. One guy said to me, Neil, should you ever marry? Your family becomes your primary disciples. To whom you're sent. It's not by my hand nor yours. I didn't choose Lily, Lucy, Layla, Liam, or Leo, Laney. I had a dynamic of choice. Don't misunderstand me. But I didn't actually choose them. Those humans were chosen for me. And I'm here to give my life to them so that they do better than me. That's my situation. My situation is different than yours, and yours is different than hers and his. And You may not have children. You may. The question is, we can all invest in someone. And, and who is that? Like, I don't think Paul was bored. He was doing a lot of things. But he's writing this letter to Titus. He's writing these letters to Timothy. He's very intentional about training the next generation. I would like to ask you to join me in doing the same. That we would invest in our kids. Whatever that looks like, whatever that means to you kids. So for some of it, that might mean a 30-year-old. Man, I know there's this person in my life that's far from God. I'm just going to start praying for them. Like, I don't have to go get them. I'm just going to start praying for them. That's how I'll do it. Or I'm going to take them to lunch, see how they're doing. There's a guy here who's doing baseball this season, and he asked me earlier this week, hey, what's one of the ways we can lead our baseball people, team, in devotions? I was like, wow, that's a great question. This guy's thinking about passing on ministry right there on the baseball field. Who are you investing in? You see, here's my takeaway for this. Man, we're, we're sent people. We're safe in God's hand. We're set apart. But God gives to those who give away. God waters to those who are watering others. God has called each of us in, in, a, in a unique way, in a powerful way, to, to love like Jesus, to live like Jesus, and to lead like Jesus. And Paul here is so focused on giving it away to the next guy. I, I want to ask you this week as we close, as we prepare to take communion, God, how can you use my life in the season that I'm in? How can I just be praying for the next generation? How can I be serving? How can I be investing? How can I pour into the spiritual health of those around me.